Okay, so we can start now? All right, so let's start. Um, so welcome everyone to this afternoon session of the first day of the Barcelona Workshop 12. Um, our, our first talk this afternoon is going to be uh, Bruno Leclerc and Luis Ruiz. So, uh, on entitled, When Fictive Objects Are Visualized, A Challenge for Descriptive Theories. Okay, great. Thanks for having us. So we're going to talk about intersemiotic translations, as uh, Carola mentioned uh, earlier. And the talk is going to be in two parts. First, as I'm going to present a sort of case study on Lolita and how to visualize Lolita. And then Bruno is, is going to talk about descriptivism more in a sort of more ab abstract and theoretical way. So first, I want you... I want to introduce you to Lolita's imagery and I'll make a case for it, uh, that it both leads to descriptivism and anti-descriptivism. So we're gonna end up in a sort of mess that Bruno is gonna sort out afterwards. Um, okay, so let's talk about Lolita. Even though Lolita's lips are described as being as red as licked red candy, Humbert buys Lolita a lollipop only once in the novel. And so it is probably due to the power of Kubrick's 1962 film and the iconic poster of Su Liang seductively licking a red lollipop that we associate this candy so strongly with the character. So this is, of course, the Kubrick's film poster. Um, then later on, in Chasing Lolita, Graham Vickers writes that Lolita herself was eventually to become an enduring object of interest for reasons that were rarely literary. Take, for instance, the counterfeit Lolita fashion, um, which Vickers argue, I need, I need to get rid of this. Is that the one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Which Vickers, so counterfeit Lolita fashion. Um, this is this I can, I can, advert. Which Vickers argues was a media creation. Heart shaped sunglasses had nothing whatever to do with Nabokov's Lolita. This does not prevent fashion companies and their marketing departments from exploiting imagery in debt to Kubrick's Lolita and selling their products to a young audience. Um, these quotes come from this book, uh, which is called Lolita, the Story of a Cover Girl, which is a collection of essays, which is wonderful on how to visualize Lolita and especially on book covers. And it was based on this uh, Dieter Zimmer's online exhibition. Zimmer is a sort of Nabucco fan who has uh, gathered all the book covers of Lovita and there are hundreds of them and they're all online. Okay. Um, these previous illustrations purport to identify Dolores Hayes. Uh, here, I don't want to go into the technical details of reference without existence. So I use identify as a sort of blanket term. And if you're familiar with Goodman's terminology, I'm now talking not of illustrations of Lolita, but Lolita illustrations. So there are a bunch of them. And at first glance, there are two opposite views on identification of fictional character. You can go descriptivist and say that you identify a fictional character through, through a satisfaction of uh, predicates. Or you can be anti-descriptivist, which is the contrary view. It would be either direct identification through acquaintance or identification through or origin. Doesn't matter. The, the, the fact is that it's a relation to the fictional character. And my claim here is going to be that a short study of book covers shows that designers, they presuppose both views, even though both views are contradictory. Okay, so... Um, I'll skip this. Um, a few words on Nabokov's intentions before we, we start. So Nabokov's intentions were disregarded from the very beginning. And especially in two letters to the first American edition, he says, explicitly says, no girls. But of course, you know, there are girls everywhere on, on book covers. We can go back to this on the q and um, I just put these words for uh, the sake of... Uh, for. Okay, so first part, from bad representations to anti-descriptivism. Here are two bad representations, blatantly bad. The first one, which is the Turkish cover from 1969, 
uh, pictures of Lolita, which looks like a 21 year old girl. And the uh, one on the right is blonde, whereas Lolita is not blonde in the, in the text. So they are blatant misrepresentations at the level of elucidation in French terminology. So they, they don't go with what's true in the fiction. That's the problem. Um, descriptivism has to tell you that these blatant misrepresentations fail to identify Lolita because the predicates expressed by the depiction are different from the one expressed in Nabokov's text. And so the depicted girls on the cover do not identify Lolita. This is, of course, very counterintuitive. Now I've lost pen. And I'll go back. And of course, this is very familiar uh, from because in order to misrepresent X, you need first to identify X and then ascribe wrong properties. And of course, if you're familiar with the philosophy of language, you know, remember Kruke on Aristotle and, uh, and Schmidt. I mean, the case was made against descriptivism. Now, if you look at these two pictures, maybe you want to say, well, we identify Lolita because it's written Lolita on the cover, right? And so this is what I take to be the Orbaneja style of misidentification. So this is from Don Quixote. Orbaneja is a very famous painter that was at Ubeda, who when they asked him what he was painting, used to say, whatever it may turn out. And if he changed the paint to cock, he ruled right under it. This is a cock for fear they might think it was a fox. Okay, so it's a sort of general way of going through misrepresentation. Maybe you just use language and, and you're fine with it. Uh, so in order to make the case and go around this Orbaneja style of uh, response, I'll go into the level of thematic interpretation in friends' vocabulary. Okay, so I'll actually discuss this Sue Lyon pose. This is LM Pfeiffer on this. However iconic it has become this popular image of a lascivious Lolita licking a lollipop in the manner of an experienced porn star is a blatant misrepresentation of Nabokov's novel, its characters and its themes. Such sexually explicit covers continue to perpetuate a narrative nowhere to be found in Nabokov's text. That a 12-year-old American kid named Dolores Hayes was possessed of a promiscuous sexual appetite and highly charged erotic tastes. Nor do these covers bear any resemblance to the fantasized nymphid conjured by Humbert's romantic imagination, an enthralling image to which he sacrifices the actual child's welfare. And in this case, you can see that the misinterpretation is at the level of what the text conveys, not what's true in the fiction. So you cannot, it's not a Orbaneja style erroneous that you, you don't know how to draw. Um, according to descriptivism, and granted that Pfeiffer is right, that these representations are like completely add off, uh, add odd, uh, Kubrick's film and the counterfeit Lolita fashion has nothing to do with Lolita because they don't identify Lolita. And anti-descriptivism is obviously better because Kubrick identifies Lolita by adapting the novel. It's a bad adaptation, but it's still an adaptation. That's the idea. And of course, the counterfeit Lolita fashion then points back to Kubrick. So you have Nabokov, Kubrick pointing to Nabokov, and then the counterfeit Lolita fashion pointing to Kubrick. And again, uh, misrepresentation presupposes identification. And in this case, the misrepresentation is grounded on a shared, controversial, even perhaps polemical uh, interpretation of the original story, Pache Nabokov's intention. Okay, so this was a case. You should now be convinced that misrepresentations just tell you that we don't identify uh, fictional characters through descriptivist uh, strategies. Now I'm going to complicate matters and, and show to you that descriptivism is still in the vicinity. Here is a good representation of Lolita, according to Zimmer, the guy who collected all these uh, uh, book covers. Rather than setting a supposedly real Lolita on the cover, going with an older painting is actually not a bad idea. 
It is, so to speak, an unobtrusive indicator of artistic merit and conveys something to the potential reader. Although this book deals with the erotic appeal of a young girl, it is not pornography and there is no crude realism to be expected, but rather an, an exceptionally artistic rendering of the material. And this one uh, from a Penguin uh, edition is a detail from Baltus uh, painting, which is called Girl with Cat. And it's the painting is from 1937. I should again do this. That's the one. And Lolita was published in 1955. Here is I, I want to read this Simmer quote because it's it's typically uh, typically descriptivist as you'll as you'll see. So the preference for Baltus is appropriate for a number of reasons. First, he's one of the modern artists Nabokov held in high regard. And for those who knew Nabokov, you know, he doesn't, held, he doesn't hold many modern artists in high regard. In an interview with Alfred Apple, uh, Apple in 1970, Nabokov began praising the artist without being prompted. A contemporary artist who I admire, not only because he painted a Lolita-like creature, is Baltus. Nabokov is re referring to the numerous nymphs that Baltus created during his lifetime, works that were often rightly described as unsettling. The figures were girlish forms, somewhere between child and woman, and set within a sort of anachronistic ambience. They always seemed to exhibit an element of the surreal. In no conventional way could they be construed as cute or sexy, and they, bec they become erotic only under the gaze of the viewer. Each one is serious, self-absorbed, enigmatic, and unsettling. Yet, either in spite of, or precisely because of their distance, they appear to attract covetous glances, neither reluctantly nor entirely unintentionally. Many appear as if they'd just been raped or were about to be raped. In this respect, they are similar to Lolita, a perfect illustration for the novel. So, Simmons' reasoning is typically descriptivist. He says that we can, or maybe we should, identify Lolita with Baltus's uh, Girl with Cats because they are similar, both at the level of what's true in the fiction, but also in thematic interpretation. And moreover, as you've uh, already understood, this artistic solution, as Simmer calls it, is incompatible with this anti-descriptivism I, I was I was talking about, because the painting precedes the story, so they don't point to the original text. And this solution is actually all over the place. So on book covers, you always, well, not always, you very often use already existing paintings. And it, it may not be a coincidence that the, the new Penguin editions of Nabokov's complete work went for this artistic solution. So this one is Ada Ada. Uh, it's taken from a detail of a 1935 painting and it was published in 1969. And actually they used Meredith Frampton for the whole collection of Nabokov's uh, work. Okay, so let me wrap up. So Lolita is arguably one of the most spectacular case of massive misinterpretations. We, we can discuss this. Maybe my case was based on, on Lolita because it's a good case of misinterpretation. Uh, what I showed is that interestingly, looking at covers, I showed that visualizing fictional characters push, pushes in two opposite directions. On the one hand, the mere possibility of misrepresentations is incompatible with descriptivism. So it says that in order to identify a fictional character, you cannot always, it cannot always be the result of a satisfaction procedure. But on the other hand, the mere possibility of artistic covers is incompatible with originalism or this uh, anti-descriptivism alternative, because it is possible sometimes to identify a fictional character via the relevant features. So now we're left with, you know, neither descriptivism nor anti-descriptivism. And this is your time. Yeah. Yeah. What I'll try to do is just provide arguments against descriptivism. And I'll start with a, a very strong case of descriptivism, which is my own you know, theory of 
of uh, inexistent objects. And uh, basically, I'll try to show that there are arguments against this descriptive, strong descriptive theory, but also some arguments that also go perhaps for against all uh, descriptivist theories, especially when uh, visualizing uh, fictional characters or fictional objects uh, is concerned. So, um, you know, this Meinungen theory that claims that even some objects which are not, which have no sign, uh, have a sore sign, they have qualities, and they can be the genuine subjects of true judgments, which attribute to this object three kinds of properties, basically. First, their own constitutive properties. So the golden mountain is constitutively a mountain. Pegasus is a winch or according to the native work. So this is kind of a judgment which can be attributed, uh, can be made about this object. Uh, another kind of properties are ontological properties. So the golden mountain does not exist, it, but is possible. Uh, Pegasus does not exist, perhaps is possible, is incomplete. We'll come back to this uh, notion of incompleteness. And the third kind of properties which can tr truly be attributed to this object are converse intentional, what I name converse intentional property, basically uh, being the object of intentional attitude from subjects. So the golden mountain is wanted by gold diggers or, or Pegasus was admired by Greek children and these kind of things. So you, you know that there have been uh, model logic, uh, methodological systems uh, trying to uh, formalize these uh, Mayungian ideas. This is Routley's uh, non east logic uh, or Sylvan's non east logic. So uh, as in free logic, he had uh, existence, uh, existent, an existence predicate, first order predicate, and then changes the rules for existence generalization and universal instantiation. He also adds a possibility predicate because he wants also to, to deal with impossible objects. Uh, and then he suggests that we could either go for neutral quantifiers and keep the ge existence generalization and universal instantiation rules. So when you have some X RF, uh, you're just claiming that some X, be they existent or not, be they possible or not, are X. And it, it has not the same sense as there are X that are F. Um, now, Routley, as any Meinungen uh, theory, uh, uh, logician, uh, just like Meinung did, has to distinguish between two kinds of properties. So, Ontological properties are, as they say, extra nuclear or extra constitutive, niche constitutorish, uh, say Meinung, because otherwise, of course, you could prove the existence of the existent god of mountain, which is constitutively existent. The existent god could uh, is obviously constitutively existing and things like that. And ontological properties uh, only uh, are just supervening basically on uh, nuclear properties. Uh, they can even sometimes be defined through some second order quantification. So being possible, which is an ontological property, basically is being consistent. It is for all sets of, uh, for all kind, uh, for all, all uh, pair of a property and its complement, complementary property. Uh, you uh, you don't have both of them, uh, and being existent at least implies being complete. <clears throat> Or sometimes is uh, is uh, identical to be complete for some minor logicians. It is for all pair of properties and it's complementary. Uh, you at least have one of them. Otherwise, you're incomplete and not existent uh, for that reason. Uh, and as for converse, converse intentional properties, most of the minor logicians take them as to be uh, extra nuclear and supervening on nuclear properties, but. Uh, jacket uh, uh, thinks they are nuclear, actually. But what I want to, sh to say now is that this Meinungen theory is strongly descriptivist because of two reasons, two principles. First, this characterization postulate, which claims that every object has, truly has, its constitutive properties, its nuclear constitutive properties. So the actual king of France truly is a king. The round square truly is square. And second, second principles that inexistent objects are incomplete. Uh, it means that, that inexistent objects only have their constitutive properties and some analytic consequences of them. So as Doyle does not 
say so. Uh, Sherlock Holmes neither has a mole on his right shoulder nor hasn't a mole on his right shoulder. It's, it's incomplete. And he, Sherlock Holmes, violates the law of excluded middle uh, according to that property. And the same, the Golden Mountain neither has nor hasn't uh, uh, snow on its top. And the triangle, the general triangle, neither has, is nor isn't a triangular. And that means that uh, every change of property yields to another, another Meiningen object. So the Balkan, the Ball King of France is not the same ob Meiningen object as the King of France. The blue round square is not the same Meiningen object as the round square is. So this has a consequence that Meiningen object keeps the properties in all possible words. So uh, basically the Ball King of France and the King of France uh, stand do not exist, but stand in every world, and they stand next, next to each other, which has a very nice consequence for uh, a logical consequence that uh, Bach and Formula and its converse are uh, true in this systems because all possible words basically have the same domain of objects. Uh, but not only do they keep their nuclear properties, but they, as I showed, uh, they also keep uh, all their extra nuclear properties, or most of their extra nuclear properties. Since, you know, um, because you keep, I mean, impossible objects uh, stay impossible in all words. If you have a pair of uh, contradictory properties, then you will keep them in all words and be impossible in all words. But the same is, is true for completeness. If you are incomplete, you'll stay incomplete in all words, otherwise you change your identity, and then you stay in existence in all words. And this has a consequence that being possible is not the same as possibly existing. And this is what Routley acknowledges. So being possible, being non-contradictory, does not imply that you could, could exist. Because, because if you are impossible and incomplete, there is no world where you can, you, you, you do, you can exist. Uh, Terence Parsons uh, has made a very strong uh, version of that uh, mining and logic by claiming that each object corresponds to a set of properties, which is either a closed set of properties or it could be closed under replication. Uh, so the round square is just a set of being round or square, or it could be the set of being round, square, and then all uh, uh, analytic consequences of uh, the first, these first two properties. And this, the golden mountain is a, mon is a mountain, is a set made of being the, uh, the property of being a mountain, being made of gold, and perhaps there are analytic consequences. And this is also true for Pegasus. Of course, the set is far uh, larger. And it's also the case for all mining and objects, including uh, existent objects. So Bruno Clair is just a set of properties. And in that case, every judgment attributing to uh, an object a nuclear property is analytic in a very strong sense. Basically, an object has a property if that property belongs to the set which corresponds to this object. So the actual king of France is a king because being a king is part of the, its constitutive property. It's, it's a property taking part in the set. Um, it's a member of the set which corresponds to the actual king of France. Bruno Leclerc is bold because boldness is one of his, is the property uh, which makes the set of, king, uh, of uh, Bruno Leclerc. Um, and only some judgments attributing extra nuclear properties could be synthetic. This is the case in Parsons' system because Parsons take uh, completeness to be a necessary condition for being for it being existent, but not sufficient uh, condition. And for that reason, uh, they could be complete non-existent object. And in that case, these object could change some extra nuclear properties from one word to the other one, so these properties could be contingent, basically. If you don't want to buy that Bruno Leclerc is bold the same way as the King of France is bold, the bold King of France is bold, uh, you need, of course, to go for uh, a distinction between two kinds of predication, as William Rappaport and Edward Zalta did. So distinguishing between some constitutive predication and coding. Uh, so this is the analytic predication. A is an F by definition or by constitution, basically. So A is an F if F is one of the a member of the set of properties uh, corresponding to that object. The ball of King, King of France is ball in that way, 
by constitutive predication, it's constitutive ball. Why Bruno Clair is just contingently ball, exemplifies boldness, and you will claim then that actual objects exemplify the properties while uh, inexistent objects encode, but do not exemplify the properties. So this is, this just reminds you about the frame, uh, a general frame of Meinungian logics, of several systems of Meinungian logic. Now, do we want fictional objects to be dealt by these Meinungian tools? Basically, do we want Sherlock Holmes or the man in uh, Komak Makati's The Reward book? You know, this guy is only referred to as the man, never named. Uh, do we want Sherlock Holmes and the man be dealt the same way as the Golden Mountain takers as such is? This would mean that like the Golden Mountain, Holmes and the man would just be a set of constitutive properties the one which are explicitly attributed to them in those novels and some analytic consequences of them. And therefore they would be incomplete. Uh, Holmes and the man would be the subjects of analytic propositions and Holmes or the man could not change any of the properties without changing identity. Now I take these as uh, dubious consequences of uh, these systems because basically this perhaps could work if you want to uh, deal with the expert view on Sherlock Holmes. But for the, na for the naive reader of Sherlock Holmes, uh, for, of Doyle's novels, you would claim that unlike the Golden Mountain taken as such, Sherlock Holmes does not boil down to some large set of explicit, explicit state properties and their analytic consequences. Basically, the name Sherlock Holmes is supposed to refer to an individual object, a concrete object, which is described in those novels rather than defined by those novels. And for the naive reader, the, this object is supposed to exist and to be complete in its fictional world. In the world where he exists, Holm either has or doesn't have a mole on his right shoulder, basically, only we don't know. But so this is, there is some kind of epistemic Incompleteness, which is not an ontological completeness. We don't know whether Sherlock Holmes has a mole or not, but we're, as an every reader, we, we suppose that he has or hasn't. Um, and this is what allows for imaginative, imaginative completion uh, uh, and, and for visualization. We, we, are, we are not only uh, allowed to imagine Sherlock Holmes and complete the description, but also even, even invited to visualize uh, Sherlock Holmes when we read uh, those novels. And we, we are, because we suppose these, uh, these objects can be completed and they won't become another object by, but just because we add some properties uh, by visualize, visualize, visualizing them. Um, and I go on, Holmes seems to be the subject of synthetic and not only analytic propositions. So in the world where we exist, Holmes happens to live in Baker Street. It does not that by definition. And you would not say that it's not the same character. If he doesn't live in Baker Street, it's not the same Sherlock Holmes. There is the, the Holmes living in Baker Street and there is another uh, character not living in Baker Street. And Holmes even seems to be liable to model propositions and counterfactual propositions. We make sense of the sentence, Holmes could have lived in a could have lived in another street. As naive readers, we do we make sense of these sentences. So there is some kind of direct referentiality with some kind of dere yet de altera mundo. I would this is what I, I would name it. Reading of this definite descriptions. Of course, it's not dere reading of definite description because we can't find Sherlock Holmes in our world. But there is some way of pointing at Sherlock Holmes and then claiming this object could have other properties. The same object could have other properties in other words. So Watson's wife could have been Holmes' wife. The ring bearer could have refused to be a, to bear the ring. If you if you uh, think these sentences make sense, you know what I mean. Uh, so basically, even if they are known by description, concrete individual objects are somewhat independent from this description. Uh, this is the case of Sherlock Holmes or the man. And actually, 
even the golden mountain, it depends on you how you understand the, the, the word. If you take it, they dicto, basically. Uh, it's just the abstract general notion of being a, a, a mountain and being made of gold. But you could also have the golden mountain taking a De Alto Ramundo description, uh, and this would basically, and which could be named there, and you could name it Erebor, for example, if, if you take a, the golden mountain as this mountain, uh, which is full of gold and and uh, because dwarves would claim it. Uh, and actually, as I even think that um, that these characters and objects could even be aimed at to referential use of definite descriptions rather than attributive use of definite description. So in some uh, of the last pages of, uh, of Tolkien's uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, the ring bearer uh, phrase is used to refer to Frodo all this way back to the county. It is after the ring destruction. So he's not the ring bearer anymore. And yet they still uh, refer to him as the ring bearer, the one who had the ring, uh, the ring. So basically these are the arguments against, of course, the strong descriptivist view, uh, which is the Mayanian uh, uh, picture but also I think against lots of descriptivist views, uh, we have some kind of uh, direct referentiality to this object. And we, we believe that they could be the true subjects of counter, counterfactual uh, statements. Here we are. Thank you very much.